Christopher. It's probably a good call. Yeah, and having, like, because you have Louis Primo as King Louis in that. You're not going to be able to top his scat and, like, jazz singing in that. Yeah. So <laughs> instead of, like, trying to cast somebody similar, you cast fucking Christopher Walken and just have him be it. I'm just like, sure, why But at not? the same time, yeah. it would be interesting to live in a world where there's a movie with Christopher Walken trying <laughs> to do scat. <laughs> and trying, trying to deliver the exact same performance. Well, he he's it's definitely goofy in that, and I think he was the highlight. Which, yeah, but yeah, stop it, Disney. Why do like we? I think we brought up Atlantis on the prod podcast before, or like we've talked about it before. But that would be a great one for them to do a live action thing of. But I guess we should stop talking about that. Reason why I'm signaling for you to stop is that I think we can talk about that another time. Ooh tantalizing future things but what are we going to be talking about this time austin today on the spectator film podcast which is this podcast Hi. by the way that was a bad intro i'm max i'm austin <laughs> if you can tell i'm the one with the bad intros but uh today we're doing watership down Ooh. from 1978 not the 2018 netflix one yeah which we didn't we weren't even aware that was a thing until <laughs> until we started looking it up and we're like what after we did the pre-screening for this movie like i started looking up some stuff i'm like wait netflix did something oh, of course they did yeah and i have to be honest with you uh, maybe i'll post it in the uh in the show notes there <laughs> some of the way they talk about it is just like i just want to say fuck you dude where he's talking about like you know the original movie did not uh re- well he's british the original movie did not uh, reflect the um, the quality of the book, and you can trust me when I tell you that it is uh, it's it's not going to be violent or frightening to your children whatsoever. It's going to be very safe and and comfortable for all families, and uh, you know it's not going to be one of those video nasties like the original movie. So you you'll you'll be fine. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> like- to me or him. Well, always fuck you. Okay. But yes, to him specifically in this yeah. context. What an idiotic way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was my pick. And, um, you know, I, I actually have not read the book, although I got it for Christmas several years ago. And I've yet to dip into that, although I'm sure it's quite fantastic. Um, however, this movie I've seen a number of times. I watched it for the first time multiple years ago now when it came out on Criterion. And... Uh, it is not a perfect movie, but it instantly, through its tone and sort of approach to this sort of more generic idea of what an anthropomorphic animal story is, kind of immediately gained my attention. And uh, yeah, it's a very memorable movie for me. It's sort of hard to describe because it is not perfect and there's a lot of like, you know, things you can maybe ding it for, but it kind of. And I mean on a story level, specifically. Yeah. You can also go into animation and limitations of their capabilities at that point, too. I think I'll be talking more about that. Sure. But, but also, like, in terms of the story, it's not a perfect story, but it just so beautifully captures a specific tone hidden in this type of, in this genre of story. And I don't mean genre in terms of um, animated movies, but I mean in terms of, you know, movies about animals that talk and they go on some sort of adventure. And uh, it's very hard for me to sort of put my finger on. But I think the movie is very interesting in a personal sense from that way. And also just there's a lot to talk about in terms of like the cultural importance of a movie like this and the type of movie, you know, uh, that elicits that type of response because of the weird position it occupies within the marketplace. You know, how do you is this a kid's movie? Is it a family movie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I know the, those conversations will have been had already about this movie. But that's a lot of why it's interesting is because it can occupy those spaces at once. And also just because they've been had before doesn't mean we can't also talk about it. Because um, we're better than yes, other people. Yes, we're, we're better than all of it. Um, I hadn't seen this movie before. I hadn't even heard of the movie. I hadn't heard of the book. I hadn't heard of anything about it. Um, I am... This is one of those movies that... like, you, If you've been listening to the podcast, you know, there's a lot of times where Austin will put on a movie and I'll just sort of be staring at him for part of the movie like... Really? This is what we're, you're putting on? This was the exact opposite of this case. This is a movie that Austin put on and I instantly fell in love with. I loved the very 70s animation stylistic tone of it. I loved the voice acting. You have some talented people in here, like John Hurt and others. But 
I kind of like, I love this. I'm a huge fan of animation, be it stop animation, hand drawn. You're seeing less and less hand drawn animation these days, unfortunately. But, and I've always kind of resented the fact that it's just like, oh, well, th- th- those are movies for, for children. And once you get older, you have to kind of push those aside and not watch them anymore. But like, but why? There's so much you can do. Right stylistically and, and even narratively with animation that you can't necessarily do with live action films. And as we were talking with the Disney stuff before, it's kind of why I find it so fucking insulting that Disney feels the need to like do quote unquote live action remakes of all of their old classics now, because why are you just trying? I mean, yeah, it's a question it, and it wouldn't be so like confounding to us. I think if it was more like, focusing on pulling from sources the way they did originally with their stories, right? Because there have been other live action versions of stuff like Beauty and the Beast. So why not? Right. But when you're doing stuff for like literally all of them and it doesn't matter anymore that it's like you're adapting, you know, the source material for live action It's like, no, you're adapting your adaptation of it that was animated. Right. And it becomes this weird double Xerox effect sort of thing where it's like why would i watch this and that's just from a marketing standpoint and me not really having seen and like these movies it's like why do i have an interest in seeing it and it's like i don't know because it just i don't understand the point of doing it it seems like instead of you know using animation as something that is like producing creative opportunities to bring the story to the screen you're like shutting down creative opportunities by making it real well, I think at Disney is slowly but surely trying to separate themselves from their hand-drawn animation past. I've noticed this with the live-action remakes of all of their classics because they're trying to rebrand them. It's like, no, we just make movies now. Look at look at all this new stuff that we're making now. I also, I was talking about, uh, I've been playing a lot of Kingdom Hearts 3, which is a Disney collab thing. I noticed they've shoved out almost every hand-drawn animation Disney thing in the new Kingdom Hearts game, and it's all the Disney Pixar 3D animation Ooh, stuff now. That's got to be annoying. It's slightly annoying, but um, I mean, some of the worlds are charming. I love walking around the yeah, factory for Monsters Inc. Like that's that's a fun thing, but that's neither here nor there to the point I'm trying to make. Um, right? Do you think it's a scheme? And they're saying, listen, people getting tired of this Mickey Mouse copyright shit. <laughs> I don't know how they escape Mickey Mouse, but. Do you think they're preparing? I don't think they're preparing. in certain sense. For I, think, I don't think they're preparing. I just think they looked at how much money they were making off their two D animation. It for whatever reason wasn't enough. They decided they wanted to move into CGI and live action films, and now they're slowly trying to shift their brand so people forget what made them famous in the first place. And they're trying to reinvent themselves as a multimedia. Yeah. I just hate Disney. Yeah, fuck Disney at this point. Fuck I mean, them out. Stop I mean this them. is and this is just the problem they're embodying in in the film world. They're the utmost embodiment to me of like the problem with like American corporate shit in the yeah. first place. It's like you're saying, okay, what you just said, right? They're looking at the profits from 2D animation, which they owned. Yes, which they fucking owned in the first place. But they're looking at the profits. For some reason, it's not enough. But it's like. But it doesn't matter how much money you make because you have to make more money the next year. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. You always need more money. It's never enough money. So then that influences everything else. So it's like, why do I even fucking care about any Disney stuff? And which is why I really don't anymore. Right. But we're not talking about Disney. But it, God, the, we are dis- doing a disservice to this movie. <laughs> we, we are talking about uh, Watership Down, which is... It has its own unique style, which is much less clean defined Mm -hmm. than like something Disney would make at the similar time or even before or after like this movie is doesn't have as clearly defined drawn lines as like something even like Snow White or like Bambi, which came out much, much earlier than this movie, but kind of stylistically it plays to that and it plays to the themes of the film. And even I know there are probably, people who are much more passionate about like the nitty gritty of animation than I am. And they could uh, point out the fact that like there are, we'll save it for the movie. There are, but there's hiccups. You'll but, like, have some examples. We can, I'll have out. some examples, but I think this movie utilizes what they were working with perfectly and achieves something that I wasn't expecting it to. I was expecting a 
animal farm esque thing of a very yeah. simple narrative of look, uh, animals are being put in a socio uh, political situation. That's it's very an allegory. Yeah. It's an allegory. It's very obvious what it is, but no, it's like oh, we're creating our own world, and there are struggles in this world, and it dares to create yeah its own adventure, and I respect it for that, and I can't wait to dive in. Yeah, it's it is it is weird how um how sort of uh, hard it is to describe the idea of a movie just not blinking. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean when it's when it sets a task for itself, you know and it's not a perfect movie. I think we both agree that, but I, I I think that really is what it comes down to is that it just addresses what it's about, and we're not even talking about the way it handles the violence specifically, but pretty much everything, you yeah. know, and characterization and you know social interaction between these bunnies. So you know this movie, there's a lot to dive into here in uh, only ninety minutes, which is nice too. Yes, so. Um, unless you have anything else to say, I'm kind of, I'm really excited to You're watch You're ready it again. to board the water ship? Yes, sure. But no, I'm, I'm very excited to watch this movie. Let's meet the black rabbit. Oh, go on. Or, or not, I guess. You're no. just looking at me. Okay. Bye. <laughs> And we should also mention that we are watching the Criterion Collection version which, of this. Which means there's no subtitles because... It's in English. Yeah. Also, hashtag Criterion hates the hearingly impaired. That's... The hearingly? Yes. Hearing. The hearingly impaired. Well, yes. okay. Yes. I'm not back. Maybe it's time. Janus Films, Max. You don't know. Well, the fact that every Criterion movie we've watched, but that's not in Japanese, hasn't had subtitles, kind of makes me feel like they don't care about that and it's not like it's super hard i do i love the world building in the beginning and it's unapologetic it's not just like in a different type of movie you'd have like grandpa rabbit telling the litter of yeah tiny rabbits like it's not framed by anything yeah it's just like this is this is the world so we have no reason to question it. Because mm-hmm. if, it, if it was like an old person telling a story, they'd be like, oh, Grandpa, that's such a silly story. Yeah, it's the difference between telling and showing. Yeah. And I think part of the reason they pull it off is because, again, it's so stylized and abstract. But also, you know, there's a certain confidence with just doing that and not having to worry about framing it, yeah. right? And, uh, yeah, it, it sort of creates a sense of comfort in, uh, in, in sort of like the knowledge of this world that I think you feel. And obviously, a movie can can sort of betray that sense of comfort if it's not followed through upon properly. But uh, I think this movie definitely does a great job in terms of setting up its world and, uh, you know, just the rules that these rabbits have to follow. And I think, again, a really underrated part of that that we often talk about is how important, like, taken-for-granted quotidian moments are in character interactions. I think this movie really nails that. And I love, I love the, it's almost like a psychedelic style of like the early like folktale thing. It's, it's so bizarre that like you are terrified of these like new threats to the rabbits along with them. Now, Max, you, you said, like you said, you were not aware of this movie really until we watched it. This is the moment. It's not quite the same, Mm -hmm. but it's like, it is weird to get such a flat shot of just rabbits dying yeah even if it's in this weird abstract style right and then you see this personification of death for the rabbits and you're like hold on a second it's a little bit different now right and the fact that this friendly god seemingly friendly deity just created a harmful world that's going to destroy these rabbits now is weird to be fair it was the rabbit's fault to begin with that's true but the god did it so matter of factly. Yeah, it's like, they're like, well, I'm gonna turn every other thing into a murder beast. That will I'm still your friend, you. of course, right? But anyway, um, what was your reaction to that moment? What the, Just, the death of the rabbits? Yeah, um, it made me excited for this because I because <laughs> I, I was already excited because of the animation and the reputation that this movie had, but you had told me cause you had been pushing to do this movie for a long time. Uh, what had I, what had I told you about it in terms of, um, 
um, just... that it was messed up and it scarred a lot of children because they didn't <laughs> understand what it was, um, which didn't get me super excited, but it made me like I would watch it basically. Um, but I'm really glad that we did watch this because, like I said, I kind of fell in love with it. It does drag at certain points, I think, but yeah, um, I do. I, I love any animated thing that can be appreciated because like I do like animated stuff for older people, but a lot of times I feel like that in itself is like done in an obnoxious way. Where God, it's like, this is so weirdly psychedelic. Yeah. It's hardly hard to interrupt, but I guess I had never just str- stared straight into the circle yeah. of the deity before. Um, I said it reminded me, I, I know you hadn't seen this, but it reminds me of uh, the Beatles yellow submarine, which came out around a similar time. Yeah, but like, no. um, that part, the, it gets more slightly more realistic here, but um, I do like, like, I love the, movement of the rabbits in this like the little nose twitches and like the way they move everything is so weird looking in this and i think we watched briefly the uh del toro conversation oh yeah the criteria on this uh on this disc right and him talking about like some of the weird technical flaws that yeah you know, came from the limitations of uh this production but like they still achieved a really singular look i think and it plays to it. But yeah, I was saying that um, I love animation and I enjoy things that I love. I like animated things that are quote unquote made for kids. I love uh, things that are made for adults, but like a lot of times animation for adults just kind of like, it's completely relying on the fact that like, Oh, it's a cartoon. It's supposed to be for kids, but we're doing like sausage ad- party adult. Hu- they just said, fuck. Yeah. Shit like that. And where it's like, that's not creative. That's not fun. You're not utilizing your medium for anything other than like the joke of the fact that it looks like it should be for kids. This was edited by Terry Rawlings. Good to know. Um, but then there are things that play the middle ground of it where it's, I hate the term uh, a movie for the whole family because I kind of hate that because it implies it's just like, oh, take your family to it. But like people, it's a movie that can be seen by people of all ages, even though this might scar young children like it did. And different people can get different things out of it. Um, there's not a lot of that these days. Um, I think there might be more TV shows. There's that show I like to bring up a lot, Gravity Falls, which is it, like aired on Disney Channel. It was marketed as a kid's show, but like, it has like humor and jokes and animation things that like are implicitly for adults as plot lines that are implicitly like for older viewers to pick up on. And a lot of the stuff in that show, like is disturbing, but it's unapologetically that it's like, no, we're still just going to show this. Yeah. And I think in, at the same time, another thing you might want to, in terms of this argument and line of thinking that you would differentiate from is the kids movie that is for kids and then has a break where it says something that goes over a kid's head yeah, that is specifically for adults, which is annoying. But again, that, that has to do with like the weird space that this movie occupies. Right. And, um, in terms of how it, I, I think it's a question of perspective and identification, right? Where it's like, you have multiple characters in this type of movie. And by, we're going to clarify this when we talk about the genre of this movie, and how we associate it with being a kid's movie. I think from our perspective, it is less that it's animated and more that it's about talking animals. Well, even then, like it's hard because like yet again, if it's animated, people automatically assume it's for kids unless it's implicitly like saying otherwise. Yeah. But I hate that. I really do. And I wish it was a stigma like we could get over because I'd love to see like more in depth, I brought this up on our Mortal Kombat uh, podcast, the Castlevania thing for Netflix. That's an animated series. That's just like it's using animate animation to create this world and tell a story. That's not for children, sure. but it's like that's the medium it's presenting with. I wish we could start seeing animation more as a medium and less as just like a genre for children. Sure, but I mean, in terms of how we look at it as a weird space where it occupies multiple roles for different audiences. I think, again, it has less to do with the fact of it being animated and more to do with the way in which it engages the characters, you know? Because we start off, right, with a type of identification that you might come to expect from a certain type of movie like this, with the younger rabbit, right? 
Yeah. Is this Hazel or Fiber? This is Fiber. Okay, Fiber, right? But then Fiber has a very adult experience, which we're about to see, that cannot be really comprehended by a child's mind, right? And as a parent watching this, your understanding and appreciation of this movie is going to change real quickly. Whereas the child will be like, at first, probably baffled and then horrified. Yeah. (laughs) By the way, we just have to pause to say that despite any sort of criticisms you might have on a formal level and technical level of the animation, I think these moments specifically, the like phantasmagorical hallucinations are quite incredible. Um, And just the fact of the introduction where it starts as like the sun setting, but then you see like the lighting change subtly, right? And then it's like you can see the lighting of the hallucination on Hazel's back. You know what I mean? It's very interesting the way they decide to do it. I think this movie, I love the real like interesting tricks they use to sort of cover up their weird production and low budget because this was a very troubled production. Yes. Well, this was what made for TV, wasn't it? Or no, it wasn't. No, I thought, in fact, well, here's the thing. The director, Martin Rosen didn't want to direct this movie. He wanted to produce it. Oh, okay. And originally he didn't even want to make a movie out of it. I believe the thir- first thing he tried to do was turn it into an opera. Hmm. That would have And then maybe a ballet after that. And then finally he came to movies. Right? Um, and I'm sure people would have been comparing it to, to cats or something if it, <laughs> if it had been an opera or whatever. Um, I, but point is like, this was not something that was necessarily his go-to as a means of telling the story and adapting it, right? And even after that, there was a lot of trouble in the production where it it was just hard for them to find a ton of money, I believe. And then I think there was a lot of stopping and starting. I know they hired the lead animator from uh, like Mr. Magoo. Yeah. And then I think the guy, I can't remember if he died or if he just, they had to fire him at a certain point. They fired him and he died. (laughs) The worst of both situations. They fired him because he died. (laughs) Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm done with you. Uh, you're dead to me. But again. And everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Anyway. You were saying. I was, I was just about to say, like, I think, you know, when you have weird limitations and stuff, often that forces people who are creative to come up with very ingenious solutions. And in the case of animation, I think it's a weird animated movie because it feels... This is a weird place. It's weird to describe because it's animated, but it's also weirdly feels low budget. Yeah. Which is usually not the case when you're talking about like movies like this, because usually it's a big company like DreamWorks or Disney and they don't need money. They have money. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the weird animation stuff in this, I feel like is so key to selling the very specific tone of it. You know, Um, the sort of repetitive movements sometimes, right? And uh, we're all going to die. Yeah. Which is a very interesting way to start off your movie. But yeah, I don't know. The animation style of this is very specific. And I think um, that specifically low budget feel really helps sell a a sort of hard to define sense of tension and unease that is supported by what you see as well. Uh, No, I I was going to say that like two things I wanted to point out. One, the, the chief rabbit looks fucking terrifying and like, yeah, you you feel uncomfortable around him immediately, which is something I wasn't expecting. Normally you'd expect like this wise elder character to like be old looking, but just like you wouldn't expect him to just look like that. And also, uh, What's his name? Uh, Black hair rabbit. Bigwig. Yeah, Bigwig. Um, he looks like just a type of character that in a different film would just be like, he'd be the dumb muscle that would follow the orders no matter what. And like, you kind of expect him to be that, and Ooh, this is then funny. he's like the first like. He's, he's the key to helping them. He's the key to escape. helping them escape, yeah. and for the rest of the movie, he plays a huge role. 
of course, we see that the uh, the reason he had the uh, the, the vision, you could perhaps say, you could justify it by saying that he got high off some sort of doobie or something. Somebody doobie. dropped. Or what would it be in 78? Uh, no, it probably would be a doobie, but that's yeah. just like... <laughs> sure. It's so fucking hilarious to hear that. Yeah, um, Bunny got high. But anyway, he was right about his vision. Yeah. And I and one of the other things that we might comment on in specific scenes, but I think this movie does a really fantastic job at achieving different optical effects. And you see that in the hallucination sequences specifically, where it does the weird like dissolves and things come out of focus and then go back into focus, that sort of thing. I think it does a really great job at uh, sort of integrating those weird optical effects into the more um, straightforward attempts at like realism throughout the rest of the movie. And also, I think it does a great job of, like, just animating different atmospherics. You know what I mean? Like, you have the stuff like the fog, right? Or light rays reflecting or being, you know, illustrated against the things they're falling upon. By the oh. way, this, that was another moment that I, I wanted your response on when we were watching it the first time. Where he says, get out of our way or we'll kill you. <laughs> yeah. And then it says, you'll be killed, and then, like, instantly tries to bite his throat. <laughs> yes. That's, like, yet again, this movie is constantly upping, like, the level of just, like, yeah, these are cute cartoon bunnies. They're going to fucking die. They are willing to murder each other. But weirdly, I don't think the movie ever considers them as cute. Because, okay, let's... No, but, like, we going in are considering them cute. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And here's the difference we're going to draw, right? It... Okay, Internet is obsessed with cats and dogs, right? Yes, we love we love fuzzy fuzzy little baby animals. Why not? That's patronizing to these animals. Shut up. No, no, no. Listen to me. When you do that to your dog, it's fine. But it's also that's patronizing if you think about it, right? You wouldn't treat a human that way. This movie is I'm saying this because this movie is not patronizing. This movie treats these characters just like they're humans. The fact that they're bunnies is transparent to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and there's no, it has no awareness of these bunnies as being like cute objects. You know what I mean? They're here to be people <laughs> is the weird thing. They're, they're not here to they're be the cute main characters animals. in yeah. our story. But it, I'm, what I'm saying is if I think about that in reference to other like, you know, anth- anthropomorphic animal movies, right? I feel like that is a point of difference where this departs from the genre because uh, it is is very much focused on telling a human story and not an animal story. You know what I mean? Because I think when you have the animal story, you a lot of time it's it's easy for people to get into that mindset of that very slight level of like looking down on something because it's cute, you know. And then suddenly the story is slightly different because you're treating it a little bit differently. When the movie is constantly, like I said, upping the ante <laughs> with like yeah. the amount of stuff that is going to happen to these animals. And that's the thing, especially after watching the beginning, you're like, ooh, scary badger. Yeah. And I, I remember uh, pointing out when we were watching it that it was kind of like, it was that badger face is weirdly reminiscent of the ghost in The Exorcist. Yeah, kind of. There's really weird imagery in this. But yeah, it, you really buy that these these bunnies are in danger. Well, it also already <laughs> has like blood trickling down its mouth. Like, oh, did it? Like, I think it only shows up for a split second, but it looks like it. So like, it's killed and it will kill again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Also, I think the badger was one of the things they specifically like point a like brought up in the origin story of them. So oh. like, you're like expl- it has a mythical yeah importance to them as well. So, like, yeah, it's one of their, like, religious origin enemies. There's lots of subtle continuity like that. Yeah. Um, that comes sometimes in the place of, like, straightforward linear narrative continuity. But also, I feel like the movie isn't quite that type of story anyway. No, it's not. But I also like the fact that, like, that we never, besides the beginning, where, like, we have the origin myth that they share. Yeah. We're never like, there's not the scene where like they go to like rabbit church (laughs) and like we get more and more like they, they know what they believe in. They know their rituals. They know like 
the things. So it's just sort of like second nature when it they bring it up or yeah. stuff happens to them. So like it becomes much more blatant like at the end of the film. But like the fact that they were just constantly referencing like their creator deity and just like stuff that happens. I kind of love it. And this movie excels in world building. Yeah. Um, Again, it it's it's world building actualized through social interaction. Yes. So it's like it's not <laughs> you, I'm sorry. You stupid fuck up Fiverr. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking drowning while this vicious dog is gonna bite our asses. Oh, but yeah. But you know, like what you're saying is correct. It's like it is not simply exposition and creating world building as like some sort of prop or excuse for a story, right? Or character motivations. It's like the the realization of a system of beliefs and values that is demonstrated through behavior, right? And that makes sense when you're watching it because that's how people are. And we're supposed to buy these as our human... Because there are humans in this movie. Yeah. We never see their faces, but we know they're there. Although I think the humans in this movie operate in an interesting way, right? If we really focus on the idea of this movie being transparent about the fact that they're that they're like kind of animals in a certain sense in in terms of the tone and what it puts them through it's kind of like the humanity becomes this weird metaphor or not even metaphor but just the fact of environmental inevitable change right it doesn't matter necessarily that it's human it's just it it's cataclysmic right and in that sense, um, you know, if we talk about the structure of the story, I think you can maybe compare it to the Odyssey. It's very episodic, right? Yeah. But it, maybe an even more apt comparison is the Aeneid, right? There's literally a journey about people whose home is destroyed, and then they have to go find a new home. I do. I love this, because like normally in a movie like this where you have nature interacting with the world of man, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, what is this? This is terrifying. But I like the fact that the rabbit's just like, Oh no, it's this thing. Like we know what it is. They they don't they won't go out of their way to attack us. It's a thing that humans ride in. As long as we just keep walking like we walk across it, it's fine. I like the fact that they've lived in this world that's been affected by humans for so long that like the wiser ones among them just like, no, like we'll we'll be fine. Yeah. It's and they mythologize things yeah. in their own way. It's great. And also again, it's demonstrates a character interaction. One of them doesn't know it, but the other one does. But that also makes a difference in how they proceed to cross this challenge right in front of them, this road. Yeah. This one's easy because one of them knows. And maybe if they knew what a road actually was and what cars actually would, they might be a little bit more nervous about crossing because it's not literally that cars won't hurt you. It's that, well, humans drive across this thing all the time and they don't care if they hurt you. Yeah. It's not that it's an animal that doesn't care about you. It's that it's it's a giant machine and they may see you and <laughs> they won't stop. Or they might stop. But like the whole point yeah. is like it's not a predatory animal that will like follow yeah. them off the it's road. It's not malicious. Yeah. Well, predatory isn't necessarily malicious. I'll take that back. Well, it's presented as malicious yeah. in this movie. It's not antagonistic to them. Yeah. That was a big fucking mistake by this guy. I remember when you were watching this, you originally thought that Fiverr had just been snatched. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, wow, that was a bold choice to kill off Fiverr in the first five minutes of your film. You're like, our main character is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that narratively would be interesting because like his weird prophetic visions were the things that were kind of driving them. And then like, yeah, to have them just like screwed in the middle of nowhere now would be a bold choice. But no. Yeah. The movie's not going to do that. And again, that does speak to, I think, um, probably something we can get into now is maybe the the surface level urge to try to interact with this movie as a straightforward allegory. Yes. And we're talking about the world building of this movie and why it's valuable. It's like allegory kind of doesn't engage in world building because it's not about building a world. It's about it's like direct one to one it, translation. Yeah, it's a commentary on the one that we already exist in. So yeah. it doesn't really matter how much we build up this new world because we want it to parallel ours completely. It's a placeholder. Yeah. Right. And that doesn't mean that it can't be profound or effective, but it's like this movie is, you might be able to say that certain parts of this movie are allegorical in the sense that they 
they generate meaning in a comparable way. Yes. Right? But it's not allegory. It's There's not an not, allegory story, yeah. This is not Animal Farm. That's uh, I was putting off yeah. referencing Animal Farm, but like well, I mean that's the that's the one people would think of with yeah. the, and I think that's also a temptation of any sort of movie about or I guess any media that is about anthropomorphic animals that is explicitly not or that is not explicitly for children alone. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a temptation to compare it to Animal Farm because that's just the obvious thing to go to, right? But this movie isn't really like that. It's no, in Animal Farm, like Orwell's done better, did better things than Animal Farm, and Animal Farm was kind of his more blatant work. Sure, but that doesn't. Again, it's not even necessarily a question of like value. It's just that's not what this movie's doing. No, and it does, and it's not like doing something different. And like it should be like Animal Farm because Animal Farm did it the right way. No, this movie is trying its own thing and it's succeeding in its own thing. And yeah, I respect it a lot for that. Yeah, and again, it goes to that idea of perspective, right? This is not an an allegorical movie, or this is not an allegory movie. It's just a movie that is sophisticated in presenting the drama and action and motivations of its characters. I'm pretty sure, like, one of the only things it doesn't offer in this is like, well, actually, it does kind of offer offer up an idea of sex. Yeah, so no. I'm going to take that back. <laughs> Sex, violence, death, and criticisms of one. You had no mates. Yeah. <laughs> Racism. Um. In what? <laughs> no, I was just of joking. the gull. Oh, yeah, because the gull inexplicably has a stereotypical Russian accent. I do like that though. That is like the fact that like because none of the predatory anim- if any of the. No, we do learn that the predatory animals can speak. It's just that they choose not to. It's or at least the cats can. The cats can. but I get the impression the dogs can't. They uh, seem just like violent We monsters. don't know, though. Like They could just I not we view don't. it worth to talk to your food. Like well, What's the point of that? The cat like kind of does it because like, the cat wants to toy with them, and the cat is also kind of pissed. Is it a weird reference that he says, talk sense for Fritz's sake? Is that a reference to Fritz the cat? Probably not. No. Or no, Frith. What is Frith? I think it. That's a deity. I th- yeah, I, can't I, th- remember I think all those. that was the first rabbit. I yeah, think that was. By the way, this is creepy. This is creepy as shit. It's like silhouette moment. Here we yeah. get the big like Lotus Eaters episode, right? Where this is the, this is definitely like the most. I, th- I think to me the weird like tonally upsetting moment of the movie, even more so than the explicitly violent stuff. Well, yeah, because you're expecting to be upset here, but like you feel uneasy here, but also you're just like, oh, but there's rabbits offering a den. Take the take it like you feel like if you were in this situation as this rabbit, which is a very weird thing to be saying, (laughs) but like you feel like you would be tempted and kind of want (laughs) to do what they're doing if you're in the cold and rain without any food. It definitely has to do with the characterization of the of the rabbit offering help to them. There's something so like mechanical and uh two-faced about it that it's like it's like of course it's going to be something awful don't go in there yeah and it's never explicitly said what happens in there it's yeah just i think it's slightly implied and i mean it's implied i think it's relatively clear even if they don't yeah. explicitly stay the literal mechanics of it where essentially what happens is okay, the humans put food in this rabbit hole because they know there are rabbits there, yeah. right? And then they take the rabbits or they do something with them or they trap them, yeah. right? They kill them for their food. Yes, or whatever it is. For meat, whatever. And uh, the thing about the rabbits offering them space and the empty burrows is it's basically a numbers game. Yeah. It's like, well, it's more likely it won't be me. These rabbits will get trapped here. They won't know how to escape. And they'll just... The, the more rabbits there are, maybe the less likely it is that I will get trapped by a snare. Oh, God. I just love, like, the way they use purple and violet in this movie. Well, it's a very, it's almost an unnatural color. And yeah. It makes you feel <laughs> uneasy because this is supposed to be a natural world. This is supposed to be like, oh, we're, we're in a rabbit's home. Why, why am I feeling uneasy? Sure. 
like it generates so many weirdly like unpredictably crazy images. Also, I just can't imagine how awkward it would be to go into somebody's house and just like eat all their food while they sit in another room. <laughs> that should be really weird, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, it would be slightly weirder if they were just staring at you while you ate too. But or hiding by the around a corner. <laughs> <laughs> if you just saw them like yeah, peeking <laughs> through a window of the dining room, like a door. Like this is the sort of thing where it's like. I would not have like a private conversation or just any conversation specifically just with a friend or something. If I was in someone else's house and they were like, what, you know what I'm saying? It's like weird. Well, I don't think they know that it's they're awkward. watching like other, yeah. uh, other rabbits. Watching I mean, them. I know that they don't know, but it's just, I'm relating it to my own experience, Max. Your own experience of being a rabbit. I'm not going to confirm or deny anything. Max. What? Rabbits always need tricks. Yeah. Oh my god. Dun dun dun. The serial analysis <laughs> of Watership Down. Do you think that's where they got their mascot from? It's, 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 I mean, that's the joke I'm making. It's all, no, I'm saying, but like, is that do you think I actually think that's where they got their mas mascot from? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when Trix was invented. This tweet, is not an ad for Trix. Tweet, <laughs> tweet at us. Are they out of business? No. Oh. no they're still Trix. I think they're... Fuck, that sucks. I, I don't think they're shapes anymore. I think they're just like round circles or spheres. That well, that's pretty colors. pebbles, Max. You don't know your kid's cereals. No, I know what I'm talking about. but like, <laughs> They're not like fun fruit shapes anymore don't fuck with me at my fruit flavored children cereals do you think there's a podcast about that uh sure there's a podcast about literally everything i'm gonna review some cereal I, i'm sure there's a bunch of youtube series about that of like people trying different cereals and whatnot Ooh. you know what i've been wanting to mention is a bit of a hypothesis on my part. Although I should probably save it until after this highly dramatic sequence in which yeah. Bigwig is saved. And already it's creepy just because of the posture, right? Yeah. And you have the bugs already flying around us. Now, something we've talked about in other movies is the idea, and bear with me as I say this, right? The idea of gore being effective when it is a sort of variation on a type of pain that the audience can relate to and identify with. Not a lot of people have felt what it's like to be like shot in the rib cage. Right. Yeah. But lots of people have stubbed their toe. You know what I mean? Or gotten a paper cut. And when you see a type of gore or violence that is evocative of that same experience, it's way more effective. And that also works for a situation in which somebody is, I don't know, impaired for some reason and people are trying to comfort them while while they're trying to do one thing or another. You know what I'm, I'm saying? Like this scene is powerful in so many different ways, not merely through like the weird way they animate the immobilization um, of Bigwig by the snare, but also the way in which the other rabbits are trying to reassure him yeah. is very creepy in its in its sort of straightforwardness and relate rate, relatableness. And this is the first time we see like straight up blood being <laughs> just pouring out of his mouth. Yeah. Did we, you expect this movie to be so gory? Um, I think you had kind of built me up for that. Okay. Um, I wish I had not. Yeah. I really regret that. I'm sorry. But yeah, no. So it didn't like shock me as much, but like it did in a certain way where like, I had kind of tried to like, what am I saying? Like I, I thought it would be done in a more stylized way, I mm -hmm. guess I thought, because like with the psychedelic nature of everything we had seen before, I thought it would be kind of like, just like, Oh, there's going to be things dying. And like, they will be like weird. Like the things like you had in the beginning, like where the hills like sort of 
psychedelically flowing with blood. Yeah. I thought it was going to be more like that, not just like, oh, he's straight up coughing up blood because he has a snare around his fucking throat. Yeah, you don't expect it to be so um, yeah. matter of fact. And again, I think that this is something I'm noticing about both of our positions on the use of violence and gore, is that matter of fact violence generally is very, uh, m- tends to be a lot more powerful. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel the need to aestheticize how awful what's happening is. And uh, it it's often very stomach churning. In a way, I think both of us, we don't enjoy it in a straightforward sense, but we appreciate because obviously violence should be should be that powerful when you see it, right? It shouldn't be uh, superfluous. Not, uh, obviously, all movies are different, but in you know, in a lot of cases, I think it pays to just not blink when you're depicting that sort of thing, because again, it creates a sense of consequences. And let me tell you, this movie is definitely, there's a reason you thought that Fiverr had been, a, you know, taken by that eagle yeah. because you buy that these rabbits are in danger and it, it never lets too much time pass without reminding you like of a new or different way in which, in which their lives can be jeopardized. <laughs> also in like the fact like it demonstrated there with Bigwig nearly dying, like the named important characters are not <laughs> spared from this fate. Like you can't, yeah. you can't take anything for granted. So like, well, what do we think are the big named important rabbits so far? We um, have Hazel and Fiverr and Bigwig, obviously. Yeah. I think those are the big three for the majority of the film until we get later on to the other yeah, Warren. But I honestly can't remember <laughs> the names. Well, of- we also have Dandelion. We have Dandelion, but we don't really know much about Dandelion. Yeah, but like the other ones aren't that important. They're just there to pad the numbers, <laughs> really. Um, Although, the I don't f- think any of them really die, do they? No, but they're there to like make you believe that they can start a war and if they get some female rabbits, basically. Like, and, sure. And to show that, like, I guess Fiverr's predictions were like convincing enough to convince like a good portion of the war and to leave. Yeah. Not too much of a portion because we see them. <laughs> well, some of them get caught. Yeah. I, I think it's quite large and then a lot of them get caught. And then again, we're setting up the dog right now. Although in terms of the, um, the actual population of the bunnies, I think uh, something you and I both talked about is uh, the type of character continuity in this and how it's kind of weird. We begin the movie with Fiverr. Yes. We end the movie with Hazel. Well, yeah, because Fiverr kind of stops being the main character at a certain point. Yeah. In the movie. Once his visions are no longer needed to guide them, like the movie kind of puts him aside and is just like, okay, his role is fulfilled now. Now we need like the strong leader ones who can like. I mean, his visions still play a role, even in that final battle. But yeah. it's like they're not, he is not the main character we're identifying with. It becomes much more of a like ensemble cast. But even this moment, right? We meet these uh these female rabbits right and then uh what what is her name clover yeah is one of them and then they're gonna escape right and they fail but you assume that there's gonna be some sort of continuity and they're gonna return but it never happens nope never does (laughs) but they do return for the dog yeah because they need that but do you think that like oh they're gonna save them no no not really it's it's weird. It's like yet again, just like the violence, it's just sort of matter of factually. It's like, no, those rabbits are gonna be trapped there forever now. Sorry. Well, I mean, you can I think it's also something that it's like, could the continuity in this movie be a little bit better? Sure. But it also contributes to this very specific tone yeah. that I don't know if I would want to sacrifice. Where like certain certain moments of the movie, certain scenes just don't really amount to a lot. But there's a weird type of like I don't want to say fatalism, but acceptance of like futility of certain things. Yeah. Well, in in the the movie spoilers, the movie ends with we having, was it Hazel like greeting the black rabbit of death and just sort of like accepting the inevitability of mortality. And it's just like, Oh, well yeah, that kind of is a theme throughout the entire movie. Accepting that there's limitations on your abilities to, to continue to do things. No matter how tricksy and smart and fast you are, like you you can't outrun death. Right. Or save these rabbits apparently in the barn, but that's okay too. Yeah. Because that's what life is. It's not merely, you know, sort of making peace with the idea of death, but also like the idea of certain outcomes happening Definitely. opposed to other ones. 
at the exclusion of other ones, perhaps. Also, one thing you mentioned during the first time we watched this movie is that uh, you felt like that cat was maybe the worst animated part of this movie. Did I? I think I agree. Or maybe yeah. I just thought that because I think it looks very strange, you know? And I don't think any of the any of the animations in this look bad, right? But I guess they you can tell that it's kind of gritty and um, straining for a certain look. Yeah, and like almost all of the poses for the rabbits, like you can tell like they had references Right. For like real world animals. Well, I guess my point I'm trying to make is that despite any technical challenges that they might face with the rabbits, they feel professional. Yeah. Whereas the cat kind of feels weirdly amateur. And I kind of agree with the voice of the cat too. It feels like it was voiced by like an amateur yeah. <laughs> voice actor. But it's uh, to be fair, it's voice acting. It's like, I, I like that though. I like the fact that like none of the predatory animals have had voices. And then like later on the cat speaks and you're just, no, the cat spoke then. Did it? Yeah. Was, You'll see. And then it speaks again later. It speaks both times. Yeah. But also like we can understand the humans and we can't understand like when the dog is barking or whatnot. Yeah. So we have to assume the rabbits can understand the humans as well. I don't make that assumption. I don't know. Although that is a weird question in, in terms of talking about the movie's perspective yeah, and identification is how are we supposed to relate to the humans? Oh, here we go. This is probably the most like remembered part of the movie. It is terrifying. Just for the, the image of the little like rabbit soul head things. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just like you thinking about it and it's just like, oh God. It's really incredibly well conceived. Yeah. Right. And just... How do you graphically depict not just literally what happens, but like the emotional trauma of that happening? And it's just like, it's almost comically and absurdly effective. It is. Oh, God. It's shocking. This movie kind of makes me want to wrap it. <laughs> How many, um, I mean, that's a challenge because those things are just built to die. <laughs> like <laughs> built to die <laughs> seriously like i some of one a few of my friends that have had rabbits in the past it's just like the length the lengths they have <laughs> gone to to make sure that they're okay is like very you know admirable to me but it's also like rabbits really got shafted <laughs> no i remember i used to volunteer at the autumn society here and we had a rabbit or two that we took care of and they not that interesting of animals um, to own. <laughs> Damn. Well, no, it's just, I guess it's relative because Audubon society, we had so many different types of animals that we were working with that. Like, what was your favorite? Um, we had a hedgehog who was super nice. Who I liked, um, and there's also a barn owl named Milton who I adored. He was a nice owl. I liked him. There was also his female companion, Millie, who was a bitch. <laughs> I hated her. Um, she was very... Because female barn owls are bigger and more aggressive than their male counterparts. And Milton was a sweetheart. And, like, you could scratch him behind, like, the neck and... And he would turn around and look at you. And yeah. be like, now you have to scratch the other side of my body. No, he was just nice. He would, like, sit on your arm. He would hang out. Sure. Millie was... No, she was nippy and did not like to be handled by anybody well, it's fine no it's fine no. she's a wild animal i get it but it's just like if i'm gonna be taking care of you it's just like i appreciate the one who's like more affectionate and likes chilling out with you did i ever tell you i had to uh save that hawk yeah you did okay i remember uh at our old recording place there was one day where it was just like what's that hawk outside there is literally there was literally a hawk five feet away from my car not even just like just hanging out there we're like is this thing gonna claw us yeah i was like i don't <laughs> I'm I'm not feeling getting super close to this hawk, but I was just sort of staring at. Yeah, him. that's what you say. I'm the guy who had to put on like gloves and a thick jacket and hope mm -hmm. that would be enough. <laughs> if it decided to, it fuck wouldn't with have me. been. No, it would have killed me. <laughs> uh, I know this because I'm especially frail. Um, seriously, I just that was like so nerve wracking because I I didn't know what was wrong with it and it was just standing there and it's like, could it just be insane? <laughs> It's playing the long game. Yeah, and it just wants... It's just 
the per its purpose here is to claw up my face. <laughs> and this is just the best way to do it, or the way it enjoys doing it most. And I'm just inching close to it. It was just like so nerve wracking and awful. I just why didn't you call animal control? I did, and they were out of town. The guy was on vacation. They only had one guy? Yes. I'm <laughs> serious. In my town, they only had one guy. Jesus. And then the person at the shelter was like, listen, people do this all the time. It's easy. And I'm like, don't fucking say that to me. <laughs> it's a fucking hawk. They're like, listen, just throw a towel on its head and then grab it by <laughs> the ankles. And uh, that's what I wound up doing. It's actually kind of sad because it did not resist at all because Aww. it was totally, I think it was concussed. Do not think it at West Nile. I think it was concussed. Oh, they made it. Yay. Yay. The movie's over. Okay, cool. So, yeah, this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. Uh, follow us oh, on social media. Wait. Is oh. it? Oh, it's still oh, going. I guess it's still going. <laughs> That's the other interesting thing. <laughs> is they reach their quote-unquote goal. And then it's not over. Yeah. Now they have they learn they, listen, we can't just have this be a sausage party. <laughs> right? Is basically what they're saying. Yeah. But, it is now that we have our own pad, we need to find somebody to fuck. Right. And it's also like, it is interesting though, structurally where it's mm -hmm. like, again, if we're talking about how this movie sort of subordinates plot elements to a type of tone, right? The weird anticlimactic nature of the end of their journey coming sort of in the middle of the movie is interesting. And I think it contributes to that. And then we meet Bird. Kia. Yeah. K E H A A R. We like. Uh, I do kind of love this though. Or like, yeah, it's silly. He like speaks with a broken, like Russian accent type thing. Is it Russian? I honestly can't tell. It's like Eastern European. If they're supposed to be English, he's supposed to be like from a farther part of Europe. Um, sure. But um. But. Is like, I guess I thought it was Russian originally because I thought his name was Kia, right? Which sounds maybe more like Russian. Yeah, well, Kiev. Um, or so, yes, something like that. But it's something like that. It's it's a but it's Kia. Yeah, well, with uh, an R at the end. And they're just saying it like British people, Kia. Well, I think it's saying that because it sounds like a bird, like um, but sure. Although phonetically, this is something we haven't talked about. I think phonetically, um, this movie is interesting in terms of how it has the fake words. Yeah. It has a, in, I'm not sure how you would deter, like, you sort of, uh, sort of um, measure this success, but it feels very much like well conceived in terms of how the phonetics of all their fake words interact with one another. It's interesting. And the, well, the delivery too, it feels natural. It doesn't yeah. feel like. They got good actors for it. They sure. did. And also, but like a lot of times when you invent a religion and like a mythology and whatnot, it feels really forced when your actors are just like, oh, well, praise be to the fire God for. You know, my favorite example of that is what is in um, the Chronicles of Riddick <laughs> where um, he's a Furian. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then they go to the to the to the uh, Igneon system because it's like hot or something or no, they go to crematoria. Because yeah. It's hot. God. I love that movie. What was the line? <laughs> what was the line that the guy used to describe crematoria? It's like, Oh, if I owned this place in hell, I'd rent. Yeah. I'd rent out this place and live in hell. And it's like, uh, okay. okay, I get it. It's hot. And Although that one, I guess you could say it was like a joke. They call it crematoria. <laughs> you could say it's like a joke. Um, that's good. Writing. That movie is weirdly baffling. I never, I, I have no strong opinions on the Riddick movies. Um, why not? I think they're ridiculous. <laughs> you know, what does confuse me about the plot genuinely? What though is like, what are, how are they manipulating him to help them? Um, he just seems to like come to the same conclusion of his own accord. Well, no, it's basically like, well, they know they're dumb for like not doing that, but it was like sort of like a necessary thing. Like that's how it, that's like, it was only us males that ended up escaping and like getting this far. Sure. Yeah. So like if we make this bird feel like smart and just like, Oh, he's the one who came to that conclusion. Oh, so it's a flattery thing. Yeah. 
It's a George Lucas situation. Yes. <laughs> maybe he'll make, maybe he'll give us our paycheck. George, how about you do it the way you <laughs> said you were going to do it? What? <laughs> you know, the, like, the good that way. other way. That great way that you were yeah. suggesting before. Yeah. yeah. You're right. <laughs> No, it's it's bunny reverse psychology, which yeah. I'm fine with. Why is that not? the problem with like just Indiana Jones? I'm not going to say Star Wars, but the last Indiana Jones, because Star Wars people were just yes man- manning him, yeah, right? They were, didn't even try. But did Spielberg just like fail at the reverse psychology that time? I think he was just tired and old. I think he's like, I'm done with you, George. I'm done being your babysitter for your stupid ideas. Uh, no, I How about we do it and see what happens, George? <laughs> yeah, I think he was just tired of saying no. And he's just like, listen, I'm Steven Spielberg. Nobody's going to be like, oh, has Steven Spielberg lost it? I'm fucking Steven Spielberg. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I can just make an act. I can just like fart an action movie out. <laughs> yeah. Like it's nothing. But yeah. I, I mean, I think he's old and doesn't care anymore. He's like, George. Fine, we'll make mm-hmm. the Phantom City of the Gods. <laughs> that was the, like the first name we'll, of the we'll, screenplay. We'll take Dan Aykroyd's idea <laughs> and somehow make it into a thing. Do you think Dan Aykroyd and George Lucas hang out? I hope so. How is George Lucas not a Scientologist? <laughs> How is Dan Aykroyd not a Scientologist? Isn't he? I don't know. No, he's just like a or weird... Or he has his own religion. He's like a weird conspiracy <laughs> theorist. That's what I'm, we were talking about. Animation for adults. One of the I have more prolific shows for that. You have Futurama, which that had like one of my favorite jokes regarding like ancient aliens coming and like building pyramids and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Futurama had my favorite joke ever doing that. Where like they go to this planet and like all the architecture is like clearly ancient Egyptian and whatnot. It's like, oh, wow, we have a culture just like this back on our planet. And it's just like, yes, that's because we visited your world many millions of years or many thousands of years ago. Yes. I knew it. I was right. All those crackpot documentaries were right. And it's just like, yes, we learned many things from the mighty Egyptians, like how to build pyramids. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> or it's just like, oh no, no, the, we didn't teach them how to do that. They taught us how to stack rocks on top of each other. Ooh. Oh, there's the key at, Wow, that dog has really sensitive hearing. I mean, it is a dog, to be fair. Oh, I guess one thing I wanted to say earlier in terms of the politics of this, right? One thing that I've been thinking about in terms of um, just watching this movie, and again, I'm not an expert on like anthropomorphic animal movies as a genre and like the dynamics of how human viewers will relate to an animal body even though the the voice occupying that body is a human voice, right? Um, But one thing I was thinking about in terms of like different bodies is usually a lot of anthropomorphic animal movies are multiple species. Yeah. And I can't, I was trying to figure the politics of that, right? Because there's a certain type of uniformity that comes with it mostly being bunnies, right? But if you have multiple species, is that, is that sort of reinforcing a type of, a strange type of like, um, oh no, is that reinforcing a, a strange type of, um, I don't know, liberal humanist individualism that I think plays into like capitalist ideology compared to like a collective ideology? I think it's more. Does that make like, sense? I, I can't. I feel like it's more like a racial thing, and it's like always slightly like, eh, when did they do this? Like the most blatant. Oh, Zootopia. I haven't seen that, but that's like. That's a contemporary example. Yeah. Um, I was thinking also like um, Mouse is one. The Does that have multiple? That's Well, that's the most blatant example of it where Jewish people are mice and the fascist Germans are cats. Like it's very, very blatant. With right. That. Um, and whenever I see anthropomorphic animals things, it's almost always like that. We're like. Oh, this type of animal speaks in this accent and acts like this culture, and then right, like you have right. that. And I kind of hate that, honestly. Um, I get where, like, from a storytelling perspective and from like just like a visual recognition thing, like it makes sense to like. Okay. It's kind of easy. Yeah, it's kind of facile. By the way, do you want to just pause this conversation and pick it up after this incredibly beautiful sequence? Oh yeah, where the. Where it's just like, well, this is like the first engagement with the myth. 
honestly. Of the uh, of the Black Bunny of Death. Well, yeah, which was only passively mentioned in the world building. You thing. really only catch it for a second, right? Yeah. But, but I, I do love the way it's depicted in this. So do I. But like also like we now know that like well not for certain, but like Do we know that it is an ontological fact of this world? Almost. And like we kinda like it's just like, oh, okay. So like at the very least we like no I don't know. But like to a degree, like yes, we know that like their rules and gods like He's definitely engaging with myth yeah. in an authentic way and using it he's applying it right and it's this very abstract interesting sequence but also the one of the things i wanted to mention that i really love about the way they animate the black rabbit is that it they avoid repetition in a very specific way with the black rabbit where it's depicted in different sort of variations of similar imagery over and over again so there's no sort of necessarily singular depiction of it you know yeah and um and I think that's very interesting in terms of depicting something as like interacting with a myth, right? I also just love the way they like manage to like, you know, fade in and fade out of its movement where it's done in the, it looks like a t- almost like a pointillism type of thing, right? And then it just disappears into dots that then disappear entirely. It's kind of hard to, to describe unless you're looking at it. Yeah, yeah, and it, like, it's almost like because it never causes impact. Like when it, the second it lands, it just like fades out of existence. Yeah. And like it appears again, like mid bounce. Uh, it is done in an amazing way. I kind of love it. By the way, this song, um, Art Garfunkel. Oh, Art Garfunkel. Um, he uh, he hated this song and then tried to cut it out of his album, and then it was a big hit. So then he had to redo his entire album so that it was on the on the album. Darn. I was <laughs> I think I brought up during the pre screening, it kinda reminds me of um what was it? Who's the guy who did the soundtrack for fucking Disney's Tarzan that was like featured Phil Collins. Oh, yeah, Phil Collins. Where like they milked the shit out <laughs> of that. Yep, that's that what was they do. playing super loudly the entire movie and I'm like, sure that's a big part of like you know, people just assume that a movie like this is going to have the song that you're going to market. Yeah. And like sometimes... Did, were you aware of the song? I don't know if you're like a big Art Garfunkel guy. No, <laughs> I can't say I am. With your, big, with your, with your Dead Kennedys t-shirt. I, mean, oh, I love I, Art Garfunkel. I like Simon and Garfunkel. I have nothing well, against Well, that's a different them. situation, though. It's a different situation. No, I'm not a fan of Art Garfunkel by himself. I think but. we know who the more talented <laughs> of those two were. There was. <laughs> oh God. Were you about to just sell, t- like, share some sort of anecdote? No, well, no. There was a thing I think John Oliver had said forever ago, where like somebody um, in the Trump administration was like telling an anecdote and like, like was talking about. It was just like, oh, do you think that like Art Garfunkel did this? And it's just like, yeah, just like Simon said, there's no need to bring Art Gar. <laughs> just like Simon said when he was writing all of these songs, there's no need to bring Art Garfunkel into any <laughs> of this. Right. <sighs> oh, but to continue and resume our conversation. Yes. Right. Talking about the depictions of different animals as sort of being racially depicted in, yes. in the difference of animal. Right. What, are, what do we think of the politics of that and how does that compare to this movie where we do get Kia being a different animal, right? Yeah. And the cat te- technically speaks too, right? I'm not going to count the dogs because they don't say anything. Yes. So they're kind of their own category. But in terms of this, it's all bunnies with those two exceptions. So how does that compare, do we think, in terms I, of the politic, political I mean, it makes it like less visually Im- immediate, but like also like it shows that like even those that look similar to you and you would implicitly trust can still be like even more like just as savage, if not more than the things that you would expect to be different than you. Cause like, you're just like, Oh, they found another Warren, but every other Warren that we've yeah found in this is just like, Oh yeah. The rabbits don't look out for their own. They look out for their own Warren. Yeah. And it's not even limited to this weird, like authoritarian yeah. community. 
This is maybe the most like shockingly matter of fact death. It's like, oh, yeah. Sucks to be you. Sorry. It's weird that you suddenly feel bad for like the rabbits chasing him. Oh, yeah. The fascist (laughs) ones. Yeah, because it's just like, it's, it's shocking. It's just like, he's like, I was lucky to get away. And then you just see why. And it's like, oh my God. But yes, um, you were. You were immensely lucky to get away. Yeah. But uh, it's just like, it's this idea that, um, oh, what am I, what, what the fuck was I saying? Oh, I guess what I was saying is that um, it's not merely this authoritarian Warren, but the other one yeah. too, that's trying to, the, 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 the Lotus Eaters. Yeah. yeah. The Lotus Eaters moment. But um, I think it's, it's in keeping with the type of tone of this movie because it, it's just another challenge, right? If life was easy enough that you could discern difference and discern ideal ideology on a shallow visual level, then I'm sure the answer to how to address problems might be a little bit easier, but that's not the case, right? Yeah. There's no way for them to really 100% I- identify and um, sort of displace the antagonistic animals in this onto a different species. Yeah. And in that sense, it also forces you to like acknowledge a similarity between these bunnies and the bunnies in the other Warren. Well, yeah. In different circumstances, you could behave a different way. And they could have done the same thing if they weren't like, because (laughs) their chief rabbit was a piece of shit too. Yeah, he was. And they were like, you're under arrest for desertion. Yeah. (laughs) It's very strange. And it's, uh, I don't know. I kind of appreciate that more than just like, oh, you have this. And then like, you have George Orwell's Animal Farm, which is like, it's like well, he's a pig and they're, they're a horse. And it's like that. That's less race and more classes. But like, yeah, but it's, it's equally, it's equally clear and Yeah. And equally. Ugh. Yeah. But again, we also, it presents a challenge for these characters, but we also see them try to use it to their advantage. That is yeah. how big wig infiltrates. Yeah. The, he's like, Hey, I'm a, yeah. I'm a big, tough, muscular rabbit. And that's the kind of people you guys like here. Of course I would want to join your war. Yeah. And also I think that the fact of them doing that also, I, I feel like, I feel like it, uh, it is more encouraging of people from all different sort of, communities and you know ethnic backgrounds for being 100 percent sort of identifying with these rabbits you know what i mean these don't necessarily feel like white rabbits you know what i'm saying yeah it's not like oh the 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 good english rabbits are having to deal with yeah the barbarous german rabbits or like the like right it's very specific the way it does that. They have English accents. We know yeah. that it's English actors, right? But like, because it's all rabbits still, it still feels very universal. And there's no like, it doesn't like problematize the, the fact of like um, identification. It's like, it's open for anybody from any community. And I think yeah. that's an interesting choice that it makes. And I think really effective in this movie. I mean, visually in the movie, we can tell that these are evil rabbits because they're dark purple and broken and bent and covered in scratches. But and they have the blue eyes. Yeah. But that feels less of like a cheat. You know what I mean? Yeah. That feels like just a cue, right? And I think it's interesting that this movie has... It has a really strong awareness of like the bodies of the rabbits you know, and how frequently it doesn't just show them like getting killed, but also like maimed. Yeah. Which is creepy. Um, Branded even. Yeah. He's about to get marked. So they know which one he is. Yeah. And the fact that they ripped the, the other one's ears. Yeah. For desertion. Grow back or (laughs) no, it does not. Yeah. So God, that sucks. Maybe they'll even give him a haircut. That's the one funny thing I think is like the fact that Big Wig, it. I mean, it's appropriate that he's called Big Wig, but yeah. like he just has like a weird tussle of hair. It's like why? <laughs> I know you have to have like an identifying factor for your rabbit, but it's kind of amusing. 
It's not that big of a deal. No. Well, if I or ever, even a problem, really. If I ever get a rabbit, I'm going to name him Bigwig now. Oh, there you go. But yeah, in terms of the uh, sort of ability to identify with the authoritarian rabbits, after they they discovered the snare, right? We get other rabbits in their own group calling to like murder the other, yeah, yeah the 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 weird warren, and then take over their warren. And they're like, no, 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 what are you doing? Yeah, and that's still a terrible idea. One, that's mean, and two, it's like the entire <laughs> area is snared to death. So it's like, like yeah, don't do that. And now they have their own nice little thing, but their problems aren't even close to being done. No. I think it is interesting that this movie shifts gears so completely into being this weird, I don't know what you'd call it, espionage? Yeah. Espionage movie? Or like a political thriller? Almost <laughs> like political espionage thriller? Oh, God, that's so creepy and weird. Yeah. Although one thing that I, one word that I couldn't get my head around is that they call like dinner souffle or something. You have to show yourself at souffle every day. <laughs> that's like what they say. Can someone please correct us? No one's ever talked to us. No audience member has ever interacted with us. That's and I'm calling for right now. What the fuck is that word? It can't be souffle. Yeah, because that doesn't make it. sense. I'm okay with that. Like it's just like some random food stuff word. Yeah, it's but I'm like, just curious to know what it is because it's like a splinter in my brain. Also, I was totally wrong about this movie not bringing up sex. I don't know how I didn't remember that. It's not merely sex. It's that 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 female rabbit is offered to Bigwig as a sex offering. Well, no, he's like. Because like they offer him a sex offering, and they're just like, "Oh, you get to choose one." And then yeah, like he uses that to his advantage because he knows that's the one that like they got the tip off about. Like she's like right, the one right. trying to lead. The I mean, he knows that, but I, I'm just saying like the very fact of that is like, oh, if you want some does, yeah, there are better ones than that rebellious one. That, but they bring it up multiple times. Yeah, and it's in a clearly malicious and like oppressive manner, right? In a status situation it's very it's very like weird and strange and maybe does that make you reflect on their own desire for does earlier yeah no that that's like the thing is just like yes we're rooting for them because like we've been with them the entire time and like we have to root for them because they're the our protagonists and like fiverr's a nice guy and so is hazel they are the good guys but like in general, yeah, it's just like they don't really care about the women. They care about the fact that like we need does. We need does because yeah. otherwise we're not going to have children in this war and that we've worked so hard to get will just like disappear as soon as we do. So, and they're not wrong. They're not wrong. But like also like it's a very just like there's a viewing weird women as commodities. There's type. a weird parallelism between like the way that the the authoritarian um, Warren treats the does and the way that our protagonists and heroes kind of attempt to rescue the does who clearly do not sense a need to be rescued because they don't run away. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, they tried to run away. One of them said yes. Yeah. And then we're like, okay. And then the moment they get out, they're like, should we run? I don't know what to do. Right. So I don't know. It is, there is a weird similarity there though. All I can tell you is that if I was doing an espionage thing, a bird is the last thing I'd want on my I side. I do kind of love that, though. I do kind of love that, like, they, like, bring this back and, like, the fascist rabbits are kind of, like, terrified of this thing. And they have every right to be. because A seagull? Well, they have every right to be because, like, every other animal in the world tries to fucking I guess that makes them. sense. It is, it is easy to forget that when yeah. you see the really tough rabbits. It's like, yeah. no, you're... You're tougher than this, like, goofy Russian joke bird. But no, let's just, like, no. Uh, they're, like... Yeah. I guess I just... Tries to you forget them. that how vulnerable they are. Yeah. It's like, no, you could get fucked up by anything. Yeah. You don't want to fight with anything. Well, that's their religion. It's just, like, everything on Earth will try to hunt you, and everything on Earth will kill you if they catch you, but they'll have to catch you first. Which is, like, a morose, but, like, slightly hopeful <laughs> thing. It's certainly not 
that sort of mythology and the ideology of that mythology. Yeah. I'm going to turn this into a rap song. It certainly does not um, seem to coincide with the same ideology supporting this authoritarian regime. Even though it... Because that is not about flight or, you know, being clever or, like, coming up with solutions to problems when they present no. themselves. It's about, like... It's about numbers and strength. Yeah, it's about the negation of conflict. Well, yeah, through all, force. all of the villainous things are the Warrens that have abandoned the tradition of or try to like avoid conflict yeah. by ter- taking dramatic measures and like suppressing it's just like, nature. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way it's supposed to be, it's just like, now you're supposed to be big wig in an interesting way. All three of the Warrens offer like a variation on that idea. Yeah. The first one, they refuse to listen to any of the people. Right. And they refuse to grapple with like weird environmental cataclysms. Yes. And the second one, it's like they've, uh, they've turned their back away from the God and have like sort of just started, like I said before, becoming this weird death cult. Well, thing. almost it, it's almost like a shark tank situation where it's like free for all. Yeah. Right. And they've, it's almost like they haven't, sort of tried to avoid conflict so much as it is like they've accepted its inevitability to the point where it's like they stop trying to address it. Yeah. It amounts to the same thing, but it's because they accept it as being too inevitable that they're powerless. And that means they turn on each other and it's just seeing how long I can outlast anybody else. Right. It's a free for all. And in this, they try to negate it through strict authoritarian control. Yes. Which also is oppressive to the to the rabbits involved. But yeah, it's interesting. The more we talk about this, the more I'm seeing different sort of lines of continuity through this movie. It's not quite linear continuity in terms of the narrative. I mean, especially the shift to, you know, the espionage plot. But I am noticing a few more similarities now that we're sort of reflecting on it. Which honestly, like, and the movie doesn't draw attention to those too much, no. which is why, like, this world feels lived in, despite it being, like, a janky, cartoony rabbit movie. Like, I kind of believe in all of this. Yeah. Again, we're going to keep, I think we're going to mm-hmm. keep, you know, jumping on this note through throughout all, a lot of the movies that we talk about, in which if you want to have a strong world in which your characters inhabit, you can focus on all the cool little details, right? Yeah. But the most important thing for selling that is the social interactions because that is what sells anything. Yeah. If I, f- if it feels that like, if you're not drawing too much attention to it, if you're just like, if characters are just sort of going about this world and doing the things that they would normally do, it feels real. It's just like, Oh yeah, this is a routine. Why would they draw attention to something yeah. they do every day? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. like a movie that people bring up a lot contemporarily but like Mad Max Fury Road like the reason that movie works so well initially is just like you're not like even though it's like this weird war culture that like Max is new to like none of the war boys this is new to them like they just constantly are doing their normal thing and yeah. like because of that you instantly buy this ridiculous car worshipping world I'd say almost any movie that you can count the world that is created the fictional world any movie where you can count that as the strength of the movie yeah. is going to share that in common Almost any single one. I was just thinking of a strong example recently. But yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, that's a key part of it yes. for, I think, any strong example. Any example you could think of, I think we could probably find that. And I'm sure we would probably be confused by movies that fail to do that. Right? Or, or, or movies that are just like, because exposition is the bane of that. Where yeah. Like, I mean, it's necessary. It's but, necessary for some things, but like, once you have too much exposition, and like you have to constantly keep pausing your movie to explain to characters who should already know this, what's happening in the world. Then like you've lost me believing that this is a lived in believe like believable world, or even caring. Yeah, it's like it was just ceases to be interesting. God, that's so grim. <laughs> we'll take one or two of them before they get us. Although I will say one slight nitpick on this scene is I'm not entirely sure on what the failing of their plan was. 
was it that that Kia was on the there was no real bridge failing. and didn't see them. It, it's just like a bunch of inconveniences at once. It's just like yeah, maybe that's enough. There's like it's raining, so that there's no like official sundown really. Yeah. So like the timing is gonna be off, and then like he got distracted because he's a dumb bird, <laughs> and. Yeah, and also they got tipped off to them leaving slightly before they should have. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that's probably the if you had to look at. I don't know how people would measure this, but I bet you could say like that is the way any sort of a lot of great catastrophes happen. Yeah. Right? Is like what are the odds of this happening? Very low. But like, what are the odds of all these little things that add up happening? Well, yeah. individually, quite high for some of them. It's like, yeah, like I buy all And eventually this. sometimes that just happens. I would buy less if like everything went off perfectly without a hitch. Sure. Or if it was like more dramatic. Yeah. Just go, go, go. go. Yeah, I, I do think on a scene by scene basis, especially this movie does a great job at like balancing this idea of like anti-climax. You know what I mean? Where it's... Well, it, it doesn't like fall into the it's not even necessarily a bad thing to have a moment that's expected and that yeah. pays off of things, but it always downplays the very dramatic stuff that would be most obvious. <laughs> Made you look asshole. I loved that. <laughs> We've already seen that like almost all of the adult rabbits can swim though. So like, well, he's fat. Yeah. And he has one eye. True, but like, I don't know. Maybe we we're just assuming none of the does can. But Oh, well, it builds good tension. And that was built up before with the raft earlier. Yes. And I have to be honest with you. In this moment, I just can't stop thinking of like Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> He's going to the big water. Do you know, Max, that Akami will not drink water? Under any reason, <laughs> not without good motivation to do so. Have you ever wondered why that is? No, I have not. Vodka, Max. <laughs> Vodka. That's what a commie drinks. Oh, God. Oh, Dr. Strangelove. We'll get around to doing that in episode 800 of the Spectator Film Podcast. I don't know if we're going to last that long. We will. Once we're the most successful. No, when I say we, I mean everybody. <laughs> if you want to know why, watch Dr. Strangelove now. <laughs> yeah. And then remember that that movie is literally not satire anymore. Yeah. Remember, not satire anymore. I don't know how we lived in a world where that happened. <sighs> There's that theory that we all actually died in 2012 and this, <laughs> this is just some... <laughs> Some weird hellish purgatory we all want to live in. <laughs> oh, God, I hope. Did you think they were going to lose any of the main characters still? Yeah, I actually did. Who? I thought that, like, Fiverr would be a Jesus allegory and die for their sins, basically. Okay. And save them somehow. But no, we don't do that. I'm really glad they don't do that. No. Even if Fiverr literally just disappears from the movie. I'm glad that it's not that. Yeah. That anything but that really. <laughs> well, cause he's like had sort of the prophetic visions the entire time. And he's like the physically weakest out of all of them. So like in order to justify his needs after his visions stop being the driving force of the plot. And again, weirdly his, his visions do come to help them here, but it's in a downbeat and kind of depressing and creepy way. Yeah. Where he's basically having like some sort of, Panic attack slash epileptic yeah. fit. Yeah, he's having like a fit or a flight from reality, right? And just the sheer like horror of what he's going through is enough to scare the other rabbits. Yeah. And then it coincidentally happens to line up with the fact that the murderous dog is going to come murder them. Do rabbits fight in the wild? I'm frequently? sure they do. But I'm, I'm not sure if there's like turf wars between warrens or whatnot, but I'm not, I'm not caught up to date with my rabbit lore. So I'll have to 
more more reasons for our audience to interact with us. If you know stuff about rabbits, do rabbits fight a lot? No, please don't. I just want to know about the souffle. <laughs> I guess you can talk to Max about rabbits, but I'm fine. Tweet at Max, at Max with two X's. You know, this is t- entirely pointless because as if any listener would ever want to talk to us after listening to <laughs> any of these episodes. Oh, don't be so del- self-deprecating, though. Maybe they like this. They're listening to us for a reason. I really cannot stand you saying that. Why? <laughs> We're just not going to have this conversation now. Oh, okay. Don't even pretend that this is acceptable. Listeners, you... you Stop you, it. You you tweet at us whether you like listening to our voices or not. Prove us. Oh, look, the soil is blue. That's the, interesting. I do like that the colors are very inconsistent in this movie. It kind of makes you feel very uneasy. Oh, God, he's freaking out. Yeah. Look how small his pupils are. You kinda, <laughs> That's so creepy. You forgot he was in the movie for the longest time. Yeah, like, a little he bit. He hasn't been a focus at all. It's been Big Wig, the fascists, and Hazel for a lot of it. But Right. And I mean, it makes sense. Like, you're not going to have him on the forefront of the action part of the movie. But. Sure. But he's, like, literally going insane. Yeah. And then it's also kind of, like, weird because at the end of the movie, you don't see him again, and you're like, is he okay? Well, it doesn't. Is really, he still like scarred mentally, or what's going on? It doesn't really matter, though. Is kind of the point. Like, I guess. Like it's Hazel accepting death, and it's like, oh, you've sired this war, and like you, like it's gonna live on without you, and they're gonna be all okay, and just accept death. So. I would say that is the one. I just need one little. I need to see five or one last time. I guess is my one nitpick. I just want to see him off in a corner. Maybe one of those bunnies at the end is actually Fiverr. But it's it entirely look possible. Like it. Yeah, I don't know. Well, they've all aged considerably, so because Fiverr's still supposed to be pretty young. <laughs> Imagine pitching this idea. So we're gonna let that dog free. What are you talking about? I mean, that makes sense. Although I would warn the other bunnies that hey. Don't go outside. Yeah. This giant murderous asshole is going to be running around. Also, maybe not, maybe a good idea in the short term. Maybe not the best in the long term. The dog run around this area is it's probably a trained farm dog. It's probably familiar with the area in general. Could probably find its way back to you. Yeah, whatever. I'm willing to believe it. For this I mean, moment. I don't care. It's fine. Yeah. But also, it's like, I just think of all the ways this, these bunnies could die. Because that's what this movie trains you to do. Is you just start looking for the bunnies to die. You're just like, you're like, you just start looking for all the landmines everywhere. And it's like, oh God, don't do this. Don't do that. Although Hazel kind of gets the Jesus moment. But yeah. again, it's interestingly deflated when the deity actually speaks back to them. Yeah. And then the deity's just like, no, go fuck yourself. <laughs> That's it's not like, a fair yes, trade. everybody does that. Yeah. You're not special. Right? Yeah. And your life isn't more important than theirs, so why would that be a fair trade in general? Right. It's very interesting how, like, just matter of fact yeah. this movie is. And that really is, like... <laughs> I god. love that where it's supposed to be like this like big, oh god oh you treated me like shit I'm gonna get rid of it no just instantly just rips your throat open brutally murdered it's like roadhouse yeah just rips your throat out although I do kind of enjoy that they they plant big wig like a landmine <laughs> or like a claymore or something big wig <laughs> and I'm just thinking of like Monty Python why did why is it that we got two movies with like famously violent bunnies within several years of each other in the eighties? Well, this was the seventies. Seventies. Uh, uh, I don't know. Was the Killer Rabbit just Monty Python just being like, "Oh, look how silly it is," or was it actually a callback to Watership Down? Who knows? I mean, I'm assuming it was just them being like, "Oh, look." It's it a- definitely was not a callback to Watership <laughs> Down, but. Uh, You know, that book is chock full of references to like medieval romances and whatnot. So maybe there's some sort of vicious bunny thing in or something in one of those. But mostly I think it's just a subversion of the idea of the I just we were talking about before how the cat isn't like that well drawn. Yeah. But um 
there's all these for whatever reason like medieval monks their drawings of like rat of cats <laughs> are <laughs> the worst things oh i gotta look this up it's just like shittily drawn people faces on cat bodies <laughs> what it's so so terrible and i love it and the other thing about the cat is it's not even like it's not even like using like its articulators in its mouth no that is kind of terrifying though or it's also a good callback yeah the cat remembered Where's the cat remembers? Like velociraptors. <laughs> they remember. The sequel to Watership Down, where the cats learn how to use machine guns. <laughs> they know how to open doors. Yeah. Clever girl. Also, like, can we I'm, talk I'm, about how the humans just call the cat cat? It doesn't have a name. Well, or I'm anything. sure it's a farm. They have a lot of cats. I'm sure. Maybe. Big wig. God damn. And I do like how it doesn't work perfectly. Like he kind of realizes that like the ground's weird just before it happens. It's slightly too late for it to make that much of a difference. But like. Obviously oh. the craziness of this speaks for itself. Yeah. But it is shit. just like a different experience watching it. God damn it. Yeah. I at least like I like the fact that like the yeah general of this thing isn't just like a copy and paste of the great rabbit from the there oh, the war. beginning yeah and where it's just like this big fat I do things like I tell people to do things and they do them without questioning. There's visual similarities, yeah. but it's also it's in terms of like they're ugly and old, but like. At least, like, he is the biggest and strongest, yeah, warrior in this yeah, war. It's like a cult. brute alpha male thing. Yeah. And the brute alpha male is really old, but they're really old because they're the most vicious and brutal. And they can survive in this yeah. society. <laughs> and apparently this other, the general bunny has, like, murdered dogs before. Or at least is so, like, vain. That he thinks he can fight it. <laughs> he can fight this vicious, murderous dog just throwing these bunnies around like I think that's like a rag doll. I think right before that is a great moment, though, where he, like, realizes that, like... This? the No, the possibility... Like, when he's just, like, chiefs. And, like... Oh. And he realizes that it's, like, oh, they're not based on, like, whoever's the biggest and strongest. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's so weird. But we never see him die. No. But and I, I do think it's a great transition, though. Yeah. Because it's like a return to the myth-making from the beginning, where you're talking about how General Wormwort or whatever... He'll come to get you. now a boogeyman story. Yeah. And now we're, we're... It's signifying that the story has come to a close because we are returning to this idea of myth. And I do like that. I mean, it's yeah. just like a legacy that he probably wouldn't have been entirely It's very charming, with. Yeah. the fact that it's written that way. It's very British. Um Sorry. Uh, I don't think we need to commentate much on like, I guess I just think when you immediately have this passage of time signified yeah. by the fade, right. And the leaves falling, it does add a different type of texture to the rest of the movie where it's like, because you arrived at the destination right in the middle of the film and then they had to defend it and maintain it. It immediately implies a lot about the passage of time since they arrived yes. and did that right where it's like well the work never stopped you know but at the very least hey they they did in the end like get what they wanted and like they were able to settle down to a degree yeah oh, what an ending and again the really interesting way that they have variations of the black rabbit yeah and they sort of morph from one to the other sort of like a fluid character and how it's depicted And it is interesting now, after this entire 90-minute movie, yeah. where we've been weary of these rabbits dying and afraid, right, of every little detail that could possibly kill them. And then suddenly, when death does arrive, 
it's far more like it's greeting him like an old friend, honestly. Yeah. Which I know is cliche, but like that's really the way it does it. And it's just like okay. well, it the movie turns that cliche idea into something that actually feels earned and profound after you just sat through ninety minutes of being really nervous about them dying. Yeah, and then you have the weird irony of it being a very peaceful and um, cooperative moment. You know what I mean? Yes, it's an offer. And then we have the repeat of the myth making in the beginning, which mm-hmm. is perfect. And we, the lesson, of course, is that throughout their life, they have cre- they have continued the myth making. They've contributed yes. to their culture. It's interesting. Yeah. Oh. And there you go. It's the end. And I'm feeling hypnotized by this thing again. Yes, by the whatever the name of the creator deity is, but uh, El Fara. Something like that. Miguel Ferrer. Zel <laughs> Zedzim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we can't get any better than that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this has been uh, Watership Down. On the Spectator Film Podcast. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm i glad I was able to introduce you to this movie. I'm glad you showed it Great. to me. Like I said, I kind of love it. It's It's very British. It's very somber, but it's done in a way that is almost completely unique to this and Ooh, Nigel Hawthorne. Yeah. Sorry. But it, yeah, it's it's sort of it's a very unique experience. And for that, I can't really tell you how many times I'll continue to watch this throughout my life because it could be any number of times. Yeah. It's a great movie, I'll you know. De- I I think I'll definitely watch it again. I'm just not sure when. Yeah. Um there's a lot to be gained by revisiting this, I think. Um particularly if you're making a movie that you're going to be thinking about like how is this going to relate to children? And, and is there going to be awareness or expectation of this movie as being something that is made specifically for children? Yeah. Right? I was going to say like, if you have any interest in trying to like expand animate or like thinking that animation in general can be a medium for an audience outside of children, then I would highly recommend watching this movie. Or but even if you're just making a movie that is for children specifically, and that's your goal. Yeah. This movie accommodates that objective. If you're being, you know, if that was the, you know, objective of the creators. Right. But also it's like, it does it in a far more specific way than you usually see anyway. Even as a kid's movie, this has lots of value. You know what I mean? It if can you be would consider it a kids movie, honestly. <laughs> but but I'm saying a lot of people don't. I know. I'm I'm just saying that like I understand why there's that expectation, even if we disagree with why people arrive at those conclusions. And I think even under those expectations, this movie has a lot to offer. There's a lot of different reasons to watch this movie, is the point. Yes. So uh this has been Watership Down and the Spectator Film Podcast. And you can visit our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com where you'll find us on Instagram uh, and Twitter. Uh, we, still, we never start with the social media stuff. We, we, we have a Tumblr somewhere. We haven't updated it. Oh, yeah, that's true. That guy's name is Ron Boston. Anyway, shout out to Ron Boston. and there was another uh, guy named uh, Zero Mostel. Yeah, he's the guy who voiced Kiar. Ah, okay. But anyway, <laughs> you can uh, listen to our shows if you ever want to listen to another one of these uh, on iTunes, Spotify and Stitcher. And uh, we may see you next week if we don't freeze to death or get eaten by dogs or badgers. (laughs) Of course. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.